Hey friends, welcome to another episode of my Dreams Academy online tutorials. I'm your physics tutor, Emmanuel Prime, and today I'm going to be teaching you magnetic field. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the lectures. But before I forget, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, click the notification icon so that you'll be notified of our subsequent videos. Thank you very much. So, magnetic field. Now, before we talk about magnetic field in proper, we are going to talk about what a field is all about. Okay? As far as physics is concerned, anytime you talk about a field, it is a region of space where a particular quantity can be felt. A region of space where a particular quantity can be what? Felt. Now, examples of fields include, we have electric field. Electric field. We have magnetic field. And then we have electromagnetic field. Electromagnetic field. So remember, a field is a region of space where a particular quantity can be what? Felt. So anywhere I can feel the influence of electricity is called an electric field. Anywhere I can feel the influence of magnetism is called a magnetic field. And anywhere I can feel the joint influence of electric field and magnetic field, we call it what? An electromagnetic field. Okay? So with that said and done, let's now go into magnetic field improper. Now, we have to talk about the phenomenon of magnetism. Magnetism. Now, when we say magnetism as a phenomenon, okay, there are some materials, there are some materials that um, whenever you bring them close to metals, for example, they tend to what? Attract substances to themselves. Okay? So this phenomenon is known as what? Magnetism. And of course, whenever you talk about magnetism, it is dated back to the ancient Chinese, okay? Which found out about a particular stone that was able to attract substances to themselves, okay? And that stone is lodestone. Lodestone, okay? So um, this is a word, this is the awe of what? Magnet. Now, but in chemistry, um, we have hematite. We have hematite. And then the chemical formula is Fe3O4. That is hematite. Okay, so hematite is the ore of what? Magnets. Of magnets. Okay, now whenever we talk about magnets in the laboratory, anytime we want to study magnetism or magnetic field, we normally make use of what we call the bar magnet. Okay, the bar magnet. Because it is easily accessible. It is easily accessible. Okay, now anytime we have a bar magnet, just like the name suggests, it is like a bar. Okay, sometimes it has two colors black on this side, and then it has red on this side. The black side represents the north, sometimes it is just for convectional use, and then the red side represents our south. So it means that all magnets must have two poles. Okay, so we have poles now. And anytime you mention the word poles, the pole of a magnet are the points on the magnet where the magnetism is concentrated. Okay? Because if I have this as a bar magnet, there are some points on this bar magnet where the magnetism is concentrated. Imagine this to be a bar magnet. Okay? And of course, I know very well that ion can be attracted to magnets. When I, whenever I bring the ion close to this magnet, of course, if I put it at the center, it will be magnetized. If I also put it at the edges, it will also be what? Magnetized. But I will notice that the magnetism it is going to feel at the edges is what is greater. So at the edges, we have what we call the poles. And basically, magnets have two poles. The north pole, the north pole, and the south pole. The north pole and the south pole of a magnet. These are the two poles of a magnet. Now, let's also talk about magnetic materials. Now, magnetic materials are classified into three. Okay, so magnetic, magnetic materials. They are classified into three. And what are those three things? We have the one we call the paramagnetic materials. 
paramagnetic materials. We have the diamagnetic materials. And then we have the final one, the ferromagnetic Materials. So these are the three classes of magnetic materials. Materials in details now, starting with ferromagnetic materials. Okay, so when we talk about ferromagnetic materials, that is the ferromagnetic materials. Ferromagnetic materials, these are materials that are strongly attracted by what? By a magnetic field. What do I mean by that? Okay, so they are materials that actually what? They get attracted to magnets. Once they are in contact with any magnetic field or a magnet, they are strongly what, attracted. Okay, and examples of ferromagnetic materials are, we have iron, we have nickel, and then we have cobalt. And we have cobalt. These are examples of ferromagnetic materials. And the reason why these materials are actually ferromagnetic is because they have electron spins in the same direction as magnets okay so their electrons are spinning in the same direction as that of the magnets that is why they are what they are ferromagnetic and they can easily align their electron in the direction of the world magnetic field okay and the other one is the one we call the diamagnetic materials the diamagnetic materials okay now in contrast to ferromagnetic materials diamagnetic materials are those materials which are not attracted by a magnetic field that means that they cannot be attracted so examples include what you know non-magnetic materials example we have wood wood is a non-magnetic material okay wood we have plastic we have rubber ETC, there are some examples, there are so many examples of diamagnetic materials. And the reason why they are diamagnetic is because they cannot easily arrange their electrons in the same direction as the what, as the spinning magnets. Okay? So the electron spins are in opposite direction to that of the magnet. Now, then finally, we talk about the paramagnetic materials. Paramagnetic materials the paramagnetic materials okay now these are materials that are in between ferromagnetic materials and diamagnetic materials now what does that mean it means that they are what they are not strongly attracted by what a magnetic field they are actually at the middle okay so an examples of diamagnetic materials include we have sodium we have sodium we have aluminium We have oxygen and so on and so forth. These are examples of that paramagnetic materials. Okay, now there is also another way of distinguishing between these three materials. Okay, now anytime you talk about ferromagnetic materials, let's assume I bring a ferromagnetic material close to a strong magnetic field. Okay, this is a bar magnet. Of course, it has a north and a south. And I bring a ferromagnetic material suspended by a string. So initially, I bring the ferromagnetic material. This is iron, for example. And then I suspend using a thread. I suspend it. And then when I bring it close to this strong magnetic field, I will observe that this iron will align itself to the field. Now, what does that mean? It will clinch to the field. And this is what I'm going to get. So I have my strong magnetic field, my north here and my south, and then this iron now will now clinch to the field. It will clinch to it. Okay? And that is how you identify ferromagnetic materials. Now, when you talk about diamagnetic materials, whenever I bring them close to a strong magnetic field, what happens? Look at the strong magnetic field. I have a north and I have a south and then I bring a diamagnetic material, example wood. This is a diamagnetic material, wood. I suspend again using a thread. This is my wood. Now I observe that once I bring it close to the strong magnetic field, there is no noticeable change. It settles perpendicular to the field. Okay, so this is the field and it settles vertically, that is perpendicular to the field. 
Okay, so always remember that ferromagnetic materials they what they settle on the field that is parallel to the field, but diamagnetic materials settle perpendicular to the field. Now, finally, when we talk about uh, paramagnetic materials now because they are the middle how would they settle they will settle in such a way that there is actually what an angle between the field and them something like this this is a material i have a north and i have a south so when i bring the ferromagnet sorry um the paramagnetic materials close to this it will settle in such a way that it makes an angle with the field something like this this is north and this is south. It is settled somehow this way. Okay? Depending on the nature of that material. Okay? So it does not lie parallel. It does not lie perpendicular. Instead, it is slanted or sometimes almost towards the field. So these are the examples of magnetic materials. We are going to talk about the concept of flux and flux density. So flux and flux density. What does flux represent? Now, whenever we say flux, flux simply represents lines of forces. Lines of forces. Now, the big question is, what are lines of forces? Now, lines of forces are imaginary lines we draw in a field. Any field at all, whether magnetic field, electric field, or electromagnetic field to tell us the direction of that field at any given point in time. Now we are going to explain more about the concept of lines of forces, magnetic lines of forces, okay? So if I have a magnet this way, this is a north and this is a south, an imaginary line I'm going to draw in this field to represent the direction of the field represents the lines of forces. Now before we can be able to understand the concept behind that, let's talk about separating a north and a south pole now let's assume that we can separate a north pole from a south pole but in practice it is what it is not possible you can't separate a north pole from a what from a south pole and that property is called magnetic dipole magnetic magnetic dipole okay so the property whereby a north pole cannot be separated from a south pole is called magnetic dipole and if you want to know what that means assume this marker to be a what a bar magnet and then on this side we have the north on this side we have the south if i split it into two what happens theoretically you should have a north pole on one side and a south pole on one side but practically that is not what happens so if i cut this marker into two I will still have North Pole and South appearing on either sides of the marker. Okay? Now, but for this purpose, we are going to see if we can actually split them. Now, if I have a North Pole, look at the lines I represent. So these lines are my lines of forces, but they are not complete yet without the arrow. Okay? So for the North Pole, the arrows are always pointing outwards. So outwards, 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 and outwards. That is for North Pole. And then when I have a South Pole, look at the South Pole. The arrows again, I draw this, the arrows again are pointing inwards now. That is what differentiates South from North. So the magnetic lines are always coming inside. They are going in this way. That is South and this is a what? A North. If it was possible to isolate. Now, but because it is not possible to isolate, we are going to have a combined field of the North and South. Okay? Like if I have these as my bar magnet, this is my north pole and this is my south pole. So I'm going to represent a joint field, a joint field. Look at my lines of forces this way. Okay, so my lines of forces are moving this way. And then remember that it is not complete without the what? Without the arrows. So I'm going to draw my arrows. Where are they going to move into? From north entering the south okay so i have this this and i have this and i have this to represent my lines of forces around a bar magnet okay so whenever we talk about flux flux stands for what lines of forces and then mathematically it is represented by the symbol phi symbol phi okay a greek alphabet phi okay that is flux now whenever we talk about flux density flux density is a particular quantity that gives us the strength of the field 
what did I say? The strength of the world of the flame killed. Now, it actually tells us about how concentrated the lines of forces are at any particular region. For example, if I have a small bar magnet on this side, this is north and this is south, and I have lines of forces this way, Okay, and then the same thing on this side. Now, if you compare this diagram and this diagram, you can easily notice that here the magnetic lines of forces are not concentrated, but while on this side they are what they are very concentrated on this side. So it means that the second diagram has a higher flux density than this one. So that means that this guy is also a what a stronger magnetic field. And then, mathematically, we can represent flux density by the quantity B, by the quantity B. So flux density or magnetic field strength is represented by the quantity B. And then there is a formula that relates the two quantities, B and phi. And that quantity is what? That B is equal to phi over A. Okay, so phi over A, that means that the magnetic field strength is equal to the flux density over A. Now, what quantity does A represent? A represents the area, area or the region. Okay, and then phi represents the what? The flux, flux. And of course, B is my what? Flux density, flux density. And of course, you need to know their, their units very well. Now, anytime you see Flux. Flux has a unit of Weber. Webers. Okay. And whenever we see A, which is area, area has the unit square meters. Square meter. That is the SI units. Square meters. And then finally we have B. The unit of B is the, um, the Webers. Webers per square meter. Weber per square meter. Or simply say what? Tesla. Tesla, represented with the capital letter T. Okay, so the unit of magnetic flux density is Weber per square meter or the Tesla in capital letters T. Okay, so now we are going to talk about uh, making magnets. Okay, making magnets. Yes, you'll be asking yourself, what am I using magnets for? Okay, but in industries and so many things that we find ourselves using nowadays, there are so many magnets in within. Okay, so we're going to talk about how magnets are being made. Now, basically, there are two methods of making magnets. We have the electrical method. We have the electrical method. And then we have the contact method. The contact method. Okay, so these are the two methods of making magnets. Okay, so the electrical method is the most commonly used method of making magnets, basically in the industry. Okay, now for us to make a magnet using the electrical method, we need a device called the solenoid. The solenoid. Now, whenever you say solenoid, a solenoid is simply a cylinder that we have coils of wire around it. Okay, so if I bring a cylinder, this is a cylinder, of course, you know what a cylinder is? Something like this. This is a cylinder. Now, it is not a solenoid unless there is a coil of wire on it. Okay, so I bring a coil, I coil wires around it. I coil wires around it. So this forms a solenoid. So I can even use something like this to make a solenoid. So once I get a wire, I coil it around this, it forms a solenoid. And also remember that for the solenoid, it must be hollow, meaning that there must be space in between where I can slot in something. Okay, so I bring the solenoid, this is my solenoid. I bring my solenoid and then I connect it to a DC source. A DC source, but a DC source I mean a battery source. So I connect it to a DC source this way, okay, so that current can easily flow through it. And then I bring my specimen. For example, I want to convert ion into a magnet. So that ion becomes my specimen. I will bring it and slot it into 
the solenoid. I will put that so, uh, that um, ion into the solenoid, and then once the DC current is passed, remember I said a DC current. A DC is passed. Okay, so we don't use AC for this purpose. We use what DC, and remember that DC means direct current. Okay, so once the DC is passed. After some time, it is noticed that this specimen becomes a magnet. Okay, and of course, anytime you talk about a magnet, it must have polarities. And how do we identify the polarities of the specimen? Now, what happens? I have to look through any of the ends. Okay, this is end A of the solenoid, and this is end B of the solenoid. So I can decide to either look from the end A or from the end B. So what do I mean by that? If this is my solenoid, this is the end A, and this is my end B. So I can look through this side or look through this side. Okay? Now, if I want, if I'm looking through one side of the solenoid, and I observe that the current is moving clockwise. Clockwise. Okay? If I observe that whenever I look through the end A, the current is moving clockwise. Now, when I say clockwise, it means in the same direction as the clock. Okay, so if I look through the end A and it is moving clockwise, it means that that end A is a south pole. A south pole, remember that? A south pole. And then of course, if the end A is a south pole, then the end B becomes a what? A north pole. It becomes a north pole. Okay, now what if I was looking through the end A and then I observe the current moving anti-clockwise. If I observe it moving anti-clockwise, then anti-clockwise means that the end A is a what? A north pole. A north pole. That is that. Now, for easy remembrance of north and south pole, I can write my S and then try to design the edges this way. Design it this way and then write my knot and also design here this way and design here this way. Now, if you observe the directions of the arrow, this is moving clockwise, clockwise, and then look at this one. This is moving this way anti clockwise. So, south is for clockwise and then north is for anti clockwise. So, that is that under the electrical method. Now, let's talk about the contact method of making magnets. Now, under the contact method, we have two types of contact method. We have the first one, which is the single touch, the single touch, and then we have the second one, which is the divided touch. The divided touch. Okay, now we're going to talk about the single touch method. Now, According to what the name says, single touch, now I bring my specimen. This is my specimen, for example, ion again. I want to convert this ion into a what? Into a magnet. Okay, so once I bring my specimen, this is specimen. Okay, and of course, it has a length. Let's call here A and call here B. Then I get a bar magnet. I need a single bar magnet, just like the name implies, single. So I need a single bar magnet, and then look at the bar magnet. Okay, this is a north and this is a south. Now, what do I do? If I get the bar magnet, I will stroke it around the length from A to B, this way. A to B, A to B, okay? So, look at what I'm gonna have. I'm gonna have this, A to B, I'm back. A to B, I'm back again. A to B, I'm back. Just like that, okay? So, if I have this as my specimen and I want to make the magnet by the contact method. This is my specimen, this is my bar magnet. I stroke it this way. This is from one end to the other. I go back. One end to the other. I go back. One end to the other. That is how the single contact method is. Okay, and of course, again, we need polarities at the end A and the end B. Now remember, if you observe from the diagram, I am stroking with a north pole. If I'm stroking with a, a north pole, and remember the direction of stroking from the end A down to the end B, back again to the end A, down to the end B. Okay, so after some time, I will notice that the end A will gain a north polarity. Okay, so A will gain a what? A north polarity. And of course, if A gains a north polarity, B gains a what? A south polarity. 
Now, let's assume that I am stroking with a south pole instead now. So what happens? If I stroke with a south pole, the opposite of this is going to happen. The end A gains a south pole and the end B gains a what? A north pole. So that is that under the single touch method. Now, let's talk about the divided touch method. In divided touch method, we are going to be making use of two bar magnets on the same specimen. So we have this specimen, our ion, we want to convert it into a bar magnet. This is my NA, this is my NB, so I'm going to be making use of two bar magnets now. One on this side, and then the other on this side. Okay, so I'm going to be using two bar magnets to stroke the specimen AB. And then, what do we do? If I look at the first bar magnet, this is my first one, this is my second one. Now, it is going to stroke from the midpoint, from this point, down towards B. Okay, so this one is stroking this way, like this, towards B. Okay, so it is moving this way towards B, back and forth to the midpoint, okay? Now, the second bar magnet will be doing the same thing on this side, okay? It will be stroking from the midpoint down to A, like this, like this, and back. So, just like that, it will be stroking on this side, okay? Now, after some time, of course, we are going to need polarities at the end A and B. Now, observe, I am stroking the end A with a south pole. And because I'm stroking it with the south pole, it is going to gain the opposite polarity. Okay, so the end A we gain a north pole. And then the end B we gain a what? A south pole. A south pole. So always remember that concept that if I am stroking this end with a, a north pole, it will gain a what? It will gain the opposite, which is south. And if I'm stroking this end with a south pole, it will gain the opposite, which is what? North. Okay, so that is that. And of course, it is not possible to stroke with a north and a north at the same time. Or a south and a south at the same time. Because definitely, the magnetism will cancel out each other and of course, the specimen will remain iron. It will not be magnetized. Okay, so that is the two methods of making magnet by the contact method okay so we are going to talk about the opposite of making magnet yeah you guessed right demagnetization okay so demagnetization demagnetization of, of course according to what the name implies demagnetization simply means removing magnetism from a substance okay if you don't want that material to be magnetic again you can also remove its magnetism in the process called demagnetization now to demagnetize we have methods also of what demagnetization there are basically three methods what are those methods we have the electrical method electrical method we have the heating method the heating method and then we have the hammering method. The hammering method. So these are the three methods of making, of demagnetizing. Okay? Now, in electrical method, it involves the use of solenoid again. Remember, a solenoid is used for making what? Magnets. It can also be used for what? For demagnetizing. Now, I bring a solenoid, I put that magnetic material into the solenoid, but this time around, I pass an alternating current. Remember that in making a magnet using the solenoid, we pass a DC current. But to demagnetize, we pass an AC current. Now, remember that AC means alternating um, current. Okay? So, whenever I pass an alternating current into a solenoid because of the changing polarity of the electric field it is going to cause the electrons to be what to be displaced okay so the electrons of the magnet starts moving randomly too and because of that the material loses its magnetism okay so and of course with that method it is not an efficient method of removing the magnetism of a magnet okay so it is not efficient enough it might remove up to 85% or 80% of the magnetism of that material. So it is not efficient enough. Now let's talk about the next one, the heating method. Of course, heat. Heat, heat, and heat. Now, materials are very, very sensitive to heat. Okay, even materials that we, we think that are very strong are very sensitive to heat. Diamond is the strongest 
material ever known, but it is still sensitive to heat because at some temperature, diamond is going to what? Melt or react to changes in heat. Okay, now the same thing happens to what? Magnetic materials. They are going to lose their magnetism whenever strong heat is what? Applied. If I get a magnet and then I heat it to high temperatures, it is observed that that material will lose its what? Magnetism. And of course, that method is a what? An efficient method of demagnetization. Remember that electrical method is not efficient, therefore, heating method is what? More efficient. Now, we have the last one, which is the what? The hammering method. Now, the hammering method involves heating the magnet with a what? With a hammer, just like the name implies. I bring the bar magnet placed in an east west position an east-west position meaning horizontally don't place it vertically this way in an east-west position meaning horizontally okay so when i place it horizontally then i'm going to get a hammer and then stroke it very hard repeatedly okay and then it is observed that with time that the magnetic properties of that material is going to be what will be lost and of course you know it is not an efficient method because it takes a whole lot of energy Okay, so that is that under demagnetization of magnets. Okay, so we are going to talk about magnetic shielding now. Magnetic shielding. Magnetic shielding. Now you ask yourself, what does shielding mean? Shielding means to protect. Okay, to protect. Now, results from experiments show that if you look at a round iron, a round soft iron, the lines of forces tend to crowd themselves around the iron. That means that they don't pass through. For example, if I bring this iron and place it in a strong magnetic field. Look at my magnetic field. This is my south and this is my north. Now, normally you will observe that the lines of forces should move straight from north to the south. But here they are not going to move that way. So they are going to move straight and then when they come in contact with this iron, they will crowd themselves around the iron. Okay, this way, around the iron, this way, around the iron, this way, around the iron. Of course, my arrows are pointing from north down to south. Now, you observe that since the lines of forces are not able to pass through the center of the iron, it means that this place is not magnetized. It is not magnetized. What do I mean by that? If I place any material at this center, it is not going to be magnetized. Even if I put iron or any strong magnetic material, it will not be magnetized. That means that that material can be shielded. Okay? So that phenomenon is known as magnetic shielding. Okay? So this is normally used to what? To protect delicate materials from external magnetic field. For example, if you look at the compass needle, the compass needle it is normally placed in a what in a soft iron ring so that it will not be affected by an external magnetic field or if you look at cathode ray tubes they are normally placed in soft iron rings to what to make sure that they are not affected by external magnetic fields that is magnetic shielding and it has other applications okay now we are going to talk about the properties the magnetizing properties of iron and steel iron and steel now these two materials are very very important in the making of magnets they are very very important okay now and then because of that we have two types of magnets basically we have what we call the permanent magnets the permanent and then we have the temporal the permanent magnet and the temporal magnet now of course when I say permanent magnet it means a magnet that can retain its magnetism for a long period of time and then temporal magnet is also what a magnet that just retains its magnetism for just a short period of time now another name for temporal magnets are what electromagnets 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 and just like the name suggests electro it means that it is what a magnetic field induced because of the presence of what of a current now because of the properties of iron and steel they can be used for either of either of this kind of what of magnets now if you talk about iron iron is easily magnetized by a what a magnetic field at the same time it what it loses its magnetism very what quickly 
and very fast. Now, when you look at steel, on the other hand, steel is not easily magnetized by a what? A magnetic field. But at the same time, it can retain its magnetism once it has been magnetized. Okay? So with that, tell me now, what do you think we can use to make permanent magnets? Correct. It is what? It is steel. Steel can be used to make what? Permanent magnets. And why are they used for permanent magnets? It is because they are what? Of course, they are not easily magnetized but they can retain their magnetism for a long time. So remember that whenever you're making a permanent magnet, you need something that can retain its magnetism for a long period of time. And then definitely, if I want to make temporal or electromagnet, I use what? Iron, because iron is easily magnetized and of course, also easily demagnetized. So these are the, the magnetic properties of iron and steel. Okay, in conclusion guys, um, we talked about magnetic field. We started from the concepts of field, we explained what they are, we talked about the poles of a magnet, we talked about how to make magnets, how to demagnetize magnets, and so on and so forth. Now, in my next video, I'm going to be teaching you about the Earth's magnetic field, and then I will be able to tell you many things you didn't know about the Earth's magnetic field, including um, neutral points. Please, if you have questions on the video, comment on the comment section below. Okay? So with all that said, please, I would like you to press the subscribe button and also click our notification icon so that you can be notified when our new video has been released.